Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining our webcast. Today, we're pleased to present Applying Lean Startup to Enterprise Product Development Practices, sponsored by Modus Create. I'm Melissa Tinatigan, executive producer of the Lean Startup Conference. First, can everyone hear me? Great. Our speakers today are Pat Sheridan and Eric Rees. Pat is the co-founder of Modus Create, a product development studio that provides enterprise training and mobile product development for Fortune 1000 and startup clients. Eric is the author of the book, The Lean Startup, and co-host of the Lean Startup Conference. A few housekeeping notes. We'll take questions from the audience via the live chat. If you'd like to ask a question, please flag it by starting with a Q colon before asking the question. The speakers will answer questions throughout the webcast. This is a 45-minute program, and the recording will be available a few days after this live webcast. Take it away, guys. Thanks, Melissa, and, and thanks, Eric. Um, you know, Eric, I was just thinking before we started um, the, the webcast, my initial exposure to Lean Startup in general. And I remember back in 2010, Kevin DeWalt invited me to come to a, a meetup in Arlington, Virginia, that had about 30 people in it. Um, and I was just looking before the webcast, and I think that meetup group is now almost 3,000 people strong in, in just wow. this. So it's amazing how fast uh, the pace of adoption and even the discussion around Lean Startup uh, has evolved. So I prepared about 20 questions. I don't know if we get to them all, but um, essentially a set, of, uh, a set of postcards from the front that we're kind of seeing uh, and Modus create. Um, you know, a, a lot of the context for our engagements are, are companies that are really embracing you know, the browser as a delivery channel for apps and content, for emerging tech, uh, HTML5, and other frameworks <clears throat> to, to make small teams highly productive, and then the processes around making those teams productive. And so within that, you know, is this 10-year-old um, uh, now and growing conversation around what is an ideal Agile team. Mm -hmm. And one of, the, one of the first things I wanted to kind of get your thoughts on is we hear a lot this notion that you have to first be agile in order to be lean. Uh -huh. uh, that the, the innovation typically comes through the engineering team, kind of blossoms, you know, organically outward. And, and you know, there's a tendency, if you've worked in agile for a long time, to assume that, that we've already been doing this for years and years and years. What, yeah. what, are, you th what are your thoughts on that kind of hierarchy? You know, it's, it's funny because um, here's how I think about it. If you looked at the modern corporation, just pick any modern corporation that's well run, not the dysfunctional mess that's about to go out of business, but like, okay, reasonably stable, doing okay quarter after quarter, and like, maybe not the greatest company on earth, but like, doing well. And you look at how it's organized, it's very, very, very similar. What, what's remarkable to me is how consistent, given how different the businesses we operate in as businesses, how consistent the organizations look. Uh, there are these big organizational silos. You know, I like to visualize them like huge, si like physical silos. Think, imagine you have the God's eye view looking down, and you could pop the top off each silo and kind of look and see what's going in. And you have, you know, design, product management, you know, some kind of marketing, engineering, operations. If there's a physical product involved, manufacturing, supply chain. Anyway, each of these op like silos work in in, uh, in in you know independently. And what's interesting to me, I've now gotten to work with a lot of companies. I go visit these places, and when I talk to if I go talk to software engineers, they will tell me exactly what you just said. Well, listen, we've been doing agile engineering here for a long time. If we could just get the other parts of the organization to understand our highly iterative and experimental approach, the company would be in great shape. And I'm like, oh, that's a good idea. Well, let me go visit some of those other silos and see what they're saying. So close this engineering silo, go pop open the top on the design silo. What are they saying? Gosh, if we, we've been doing design thinking here you know, for years and user-centered design, and we have a highly iterative and experimentally driven work process, if we could just get those other silos to adopt our process, you know, things would be fine. And if you go by silo by silo, every, every function has an innovation somewhere in it in the last 10 years that's about being more iterative. So you can look at DevOps or customer development or uh, you know, any of your agile flavors that you want. There's a bunch of business management philosophies. And of course, on the manufacturing side, there's the original lean manufacturing. So you would be forgiven for assuming that if a company is being run silo by silo in a highly iterative way, the company itself must be an amazing, highly iterative learning organization. Ha, ha, ha. Like, <laughs> here, but here's the, like, dun, 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 right? I mean, we need some kind of sound effects here. Like, no, of course not, because every silo is operating independently. 
and handing their work products to the next silo. Like how many engineering teams have done highly iterative agile engineering uh, against a specification document that you know is like a binder full of a thousand pages of learning that the design team did with their highly iterative learning process. So so even though each team is trying to be iterative in its own way, the whole company is still like very linear, very waterfall, you know, uh, very like old school mass production assembly line. So so I mean I think there's some truth to that comment that if only we could get the whole company to operate in a more iterative way, you know, the company would be more successful. But but thinking about conceiving that as kind of like one function's dominance over the others, I think is a big mistake. Yeah, no, I think that's true. When I think back to the bubble popping in 2001 and shifting my career from kind of startup product companies mm -hmm. the dial-up internet age to working on what was then the telco bubble, soon to be apps for the financial bubble, and going in and getting advice as a consultant, people would say, you never want to be the first consultant in because they're destined to, but there hasn't been enough pain to, to op, you know, operationalize change. <laughs> and, and when you're the second guy in, you know, I think it was like, Five years of trying to help companies, you know, implement these service-oriented architectures, all these kind of predicates to services and, and APIs and SaaS, and realizing, oh, wait, we're getting paid a tenth of what management consultants do to basically say, and build a system to say, hey, there's a new organizational design. Yeah. And, and when you think about, like, these titles that have come over, you know, from the brick-and-mortar engineering business, architect, engineer, and then new titles like Scrum Master. Um, you know, I, I just, I'm just curious, like, it, it made me realize that before we could ever affect anything from a process perspective, we were going to have to deliver software for 12 months and earn trust and then maybe start talking about organizational design. And it seems yeah. like that same theme, you know, is it your experience that that is kind of the same way in terms of adopting uh, Lean at scale? Yeah, if there's this really interesting interaction between the bottoms up and the tops down for this kind of organizational change. Um, but, but, but I think it's really important. We have to separate out the, the sequence by which it typically happens when you want to do this kind of change from what are the bedrock changes that actually have to get made. Because I really am a believer that without the tops down executive level support to change the underlying systems of accountability and process in a company, you cannot do this kind of change. But unfortunately, it's the rare CEO who on their own initiative comes up with the idea that their own ideas should be put to the test in a more iterative way and that their strategy has the possibility of having some flaws. I mean, that's not the most common self-reflective uh, CEO. So usually what happens, you know, first from a sequence point of view, is you have a, an individual team, a, an innovative or visionary leader within the company uh, who's not the CEO often, who has the initial insight that, hey, we should try this out. And so... Uh, the way that I've worked for me anyway is, um, you know, I get brought into companies, often we'll do an initial, I'll just come in and give a talk or I'll work coaching a, a team or two, just like work on an individual product. Sometimes that's even a functionalized, so I'll just work with the engineers, just work with the marketers, because everybody thinks Lean Startup is just their own thing, rebranded. It gives me license to go into pretty much any function. So I've started in a lot of odd places in companies. But what's interesting to me is those initial engagements have to do two really unrelated things. They have to make the teams more effective at accomplishing their goals, and also they have to start to get management excited about the potential of change. And you would think, well, what does management care about besides results? If you can get results, you'll be fine. But let's be honest. Uh, managers do care about results, but they care about results within the paradigm of the current political environment they operate in. And there are a lot of situations where managers will gladly trade um, political capital for results, you know, 10 times a day and twice on Sunday. So, you know, it, it's tricky to find that, to find that beach. Like, that's all about organizational uh, influence and, and being a consultant. But at the end of the day, requires um, really a, a executive level commitment to make the change and also uh, the kind of bottoms up grassroots efforts of entrepreneurs who are willing to take a risk on working in a new way. Yeah, you know, to that point, it's almost like the old kind of cargo cult, right, of Agile. You don't want to have the cargo cult uh, of Lean. We're doing all the motions, but we're not getting um, the results. You know, one of the other things, too, uh, that kind of raises its head uh, for us is the context for the work. And so we've seen very big companies acquire very Agile startups. 
and and say, hey, this is our you know, this is our way of getting agile. And the the interesting thing is, you know, as a guy who's been on kind of software product teams for a long time, if you're not in that active high risk, what are we trying to build and tailor? But you're more in the feature or creative, you know, where we've gotten into that. You, know, you really almost don't need to need to be agile anymore. It's almost as if developers are kind of like implicitly know what it's going to take to add this little accretive feature versus understand what it is we're doing in uncertainty. Totally. And so when, you know, when I look back when we started the company and our, our first clients were 2010-ish, um, we're all in media and publishing, where the entire business model for a very large industry were be, was being disrupted. And it was really less, they were exploring new technologies, but not for the sake of new technology, really more for the, the fact that they lost channel control, you know, from the distribution mechanism. And as I look over the past few years, it doesn't matter from our perspective, like how agile we could have made them, because it wasn't really an optimized for engineering exercise that they were really going through. It was really an optimized, yeah. what's our new business model? And what I'm, you know, still kind of amazed at the pace of is, when we, when we look at that, just across our customers, almost as an indicator of, of, of a state of the, the industry, that, that you have other customers that are seeing this is very accretive, that there's new channels to open. Their fundamental business model is staying the same or robust or growing, and they see like adding mobile as a way to open up a new channel, and it's their, a good intro to bring new thought into how to build things in the building. I, I'm just curious from, from your perspective, like how many different types or is there a classification of like your top five context for where you see Agile getting brought into to enterprise? Yeah, it's, it's interesting you, you say because, because of course, um, I, used to, I used to talk to people who were at, in media, in publishing, in front of my, in digital businesses, information businesses, who viewed their problems as really hard. Like oh my god, the internet and our business model, and we have all these difficult problems. And, and you know, and I used to take that seriously and be respectful. And I I have a problem now because I've I've since had a chance to work with companies in industrial space disruption. So I mean, we talk business models and, um, you know, and difficult. By comparison, the, the digital and the media businesses where only the business model is changing, I, I view that now as actually a pretty nice place to be because you still have assets that are, that are fundamentally valuable uh, and you have to be willing to experiment with new models. But like, the only obstacle to that really is psychological. It's a, simply a political problem. There's no technological barrier. There's no question about what's possible, what's not possible. Um, it's just you have to be willing to, to try it. So people don't die if your magazine doesn't make it out. Yeah, exactly. Right. The stakes are, are really low, and there's no kind of safety. There's like the regulatory challenges are extremely minor by comparison. And yet, what I find is everyone uses whatever's hard about their business as an excuse. Like, well, I we can't do. You know, we have uh, really like our brand equity would be damaged by experimentation, so we can't do that. Or some regulator wouldn't allow it. Or you know, I've actually worked with a company to do a Lean Startup project, and I was also concurrently working with their regulator on a Lean Startup project, two completely unrelated initiatives. I just happened to be hearing from both sides how it's the other side that's causing all the problems and, and is not going fast enough. You know, the businesses were like, oh, our regulator won't let us experiment and do things that are new. And the regulator's like, the, you know, we can't, we're not allowed to experiment. Industry would go crazy coming in the future, or you're in the middle of it right now. Uh, anyone who was in the past wave of it is gone, so... No, no, we're not talking to them. Yeah, you know, it's like... Uh, That's the context. One of my be favorite phrases um, from early in my software career, which I, you know, things you don't appreciate until five to ten years later, was, was uh -huh. a line, uh, art becomes science becomes engineering. And then I guess then ultimately products, right? So SaaS products. Um, when I think about what it takes, you know, there used to be a, a, a hurdle rate to projects, which was standing up a $300,000 Sun server, right? Which doesn't necessarily exist anymore when you can just easily put things in the cloud. And so I'm very interested when we talk to CIOs, perspective or have they implemented a full set of tools. And, you know, again, I hear these phrases saying the CIOs are fighting or losing to CIOs. How do you yeah. see C-suite being effective? Oh, it's, it's a super interesting time for that. Um, I mean, speaking of CIOs, 
the trend I see is there's there's a tendency now to hire into the CIO role business managers rather than IT lifers. Mm. I work with two two CIOs re- who were like uh, recently installed into their job who were not IT specialists but who had been um, it worked in the business before, and so like brought a whole new energy to like driving IT for results, not just for cost reduction but for overall business results. And that I think is a very exciting exciting change and you know for some of their staff that's a new concept right think about like uh, someone who's been 20 years in traditional IT okay like think about what year it was when they first got into traditional IT and what the infrastructure looked like what the requirements are like just the business has changed a lot since then and to me the biggest change for them the hardest part was can you understand that IT is now a customer service organization so you serve your customers, and your customers happen to be employees of the company who serve our external customers. And so the, the, our ability to compete as a business depends on our business managers. How fast can they iterate? How close to their customers can they get? How quickly can they turn around services? And so I, you know, my, my work with those uh, managers has been to say, we've got to hold those people to the same standard we hold our product managers to. If you have a hypothesis about what you think will drive customer performance, now remember our customers are now our internal customers, employees, then that has to be proven. And I, I was once doing a, um, uh, I guess I shouldn't say what it was, but anyway, I, I was working with, with a group like this who was, do, who was in charge of uh, getting employees new PCs. Okay? That's their, that was their job. And they had this like plan. Uh, you know, a classic IT thing. It's like, well, if you're in this job category at this level, you get a new computer every two years. But if you're a developer, you know, you need to get one every 18 months. But if you're someone unimportant, you get one every three years. It was just like the company's political hierarchy reflected with this like rationalizing. And I remember asking them, okay, the same question I would ask a, a new startup. Why? Like, what's your theory for why this is a good idea? And they're like, oh, well, it's going to enhance productivity. I said, how do you know? And they're like, what do you mean, how do I know? It's like, what's the evidence? This improves productivity. Like, well, new computers are better. I was like, really? In a way that improves productivity? Are you sure? And they were like, I don't know. that. Like, the person was like getting frustrated. Like, I have no idea. I was just handed this document and told to implement it. And that's like, as soon as you hear that, you're like, okay, listen, you're a startup because we don't live in a time where those documents are especially reliable. Let's go test. And they were They were excited. You know, it's interesting you mentioned that about the, the laptops. Um, one of my first experiences with companies that spent you know, $400 million a year on a monolithic 10-year, $100 million minimum you know, contact, yeah. one of the biggest line items in there, because again, you, this was when Power Macs were first kind of coming into engineering teams and you had t-shirts that said, I'm not lazy, I'm my code's compiling, right? Yeah. So this notion that, hey, if more processors mean less compiling time, we're paying people out, you know, these yeah. kind of notions of that. And uh, it was also not to kind of skip too far ahead, but it was also this first opportunity to kind of look at things like real options analysis and say, when is the right time to bring in a Mac pilot into an all IT organization? Because you may have this one group over here of 5, 10, 20, 30, doesn't matter, engineers, but then you have, you know, no uh, SharePoint, you have all these other organizational things that are is this the year you should custom build all that or should you wait to the upgrade of the next operating system for Apple that may integrate with, you know, Active Whatever, Directory yeah. or something? Yeah. And it kind of was an eye-opener for me at scale because, it, you know, focusing on the micro level of an individual engineer and saying, you know, we kind of all get it and we're all second-guessing the, the decisions kind of ahead of us and understanding that at scale, just the cost of people and laptops if you can, you know, if you can make a dent in a forty million dollar spend, just based not even product productivity, but just rethinking what to invest in and what not, it's just that these are hard things. And so I came out of kind of business school thinking, why isn't everyone thinking about real options analysis? Why isn't everyone trying to do all these integrations? And um, you know, my short answer, without seeing more, is well, because it's really hard. And most people may try to get those things without doing it. I'm just curious if, if if bridging the gap in that, that hire from, you know, agile integrated product into things like IT budgeting so that SLAs are not written by lawyers but by IT people and ways to understand progressive investment. Uh, is this what you're referring to when you're talking about innovation accounting? I mean, is there real options? Yeah. It, look, uh, first of all, if there's one thing I agree with you about is that if things are hard, people definitely don't want to do them. 
because there's plenty of money to be made by doing things that are easy. Uh, <laughs> you know, and I and I'm, I I didn't expect that. You know, um, when I talk about innovation accounting, it involves a lot of math, and so people um, people shy away from it. But to me, what what all these things have in common, the kind of the root of them, is that we need to be able, like, in order to to manage such a large organization. And by the way, every startup aspires to be a large organization. So, you know, somebody, somebody's thinking about this stuff, no matter what the size is. You have to be able to hold people accountable and know if they're doing a good job. Like, at the heart, that's what all this stuff is about. And, and all, the, all the tools we use, budgeting, forecasting, schedules, milestones, um, those are all about trying to figure out who's doing a good job and who's not. And when, once you acknowledge, once you realize, that, at least for part of the work, and maybe for a large part these days, it's hard to forecast because we're not really sure what's working. Like, we don't know what's going to work in advance. So the fact that somebody hit the forecast uh, is not evidence that they did a good job necessarily. In fact, I was just um, uh, hearing uh, secondhand a story about, um, this was one of our previous webcasts, actually, about... Um, I'm trying to. Th- I, I always have trying to protect people's confidentiality. I'm never quite sure what I can and can't say. So, so I'm t- sorry. I'm tripping over myself. I'm, I'm trying to be really, trying to be very sensitive about it. Um, but simply, so a business executive was was telling their staff, you know, fundamentally, we got to hold people accountable for results because at at company X and and they named a specific tech company that has had a lot of trouble lately and is you know, going going under. They're like, listen, at that company, even as they're going down, all these managers are getting positive reviews. Because they did what they said they were going to do, you know. They so you know that that's really where innovation kind of gets tricky, and you know, if we're looking at the trailing indicators, like okay, how much money did we spend last year? Or what's our five year? Like when we look at stuff that happens at the end, the ROI type indicators. By the time we figure out what's going on, it's too late to pivot. So the real art to this is to discover leading indicators that can help you figure out if you're getting closer to whatever that goal is, whether it's product market fit in a product team trying to launch something or if it's uh, some other strategy that an IT or some kind of internal team is, is developing. To me, it's really the same. So let me say, we have a question uh, that, that, that's coming in here uh, that uh, I'll put out there. So do you find that it's easiest to bring lean techniques into new projects or existing projects? So that's an interesting project. Yeah. So I guess Greenfield versus versus uh, versus Legacy. Um, I mean, the two things I would probably share about that is, you know, especially as building off of what we redesign and have all the metrics go south, right? And then try to figure out why. Wait, we we just set up this expectation for the big redesign, and now all of a sudden. Everything is different because we introduced a new interstitial step in a mm-hmm. you know, shopping cart flow that we should have known had a certain metric of conversion. Um, you know, it, it, it's hard to say there's truisms. I think at least from what we're seeing at the beginning, sometimes that's the right approach, right? You kind of take one. Fully taken to the unsuccessful ones that I've, you know, seen the last couple of years. And, you know, what is the pattern? I really don't think it's new versus old. Like, I think that's actually not a very important distinction. Like, I, I can, like, everyone's like, well, obviously, a brand new startup is unencumbered by any legacy process, so they can adopt any process they want, so lean should be really easy. So I've met with teams that are quite small where they could, I mean, there's nothing I've arguing for hours about whether or not, you know, it makes sense to test a hypothesis or not or do an MVP or, you know, like, pick any lean technique. Like, And I've also... I'm thinking about one very famous startup in particular where um, I, I met them tangentially briefly and we talked a little bit about continuous deployment and they were like, oh yeah, that is a good idea. We had like a conversation about it and then years later I hear that they're like one of the biggest and most sophisticated continuous deployment implementations in the world and, it, and, and they don't, they won't, I can't even get them to speak at a conference about it because to them it's not even news. It's no big deal. It's like whatever, we just did what made sense, obviously. And then, I've worked with teams inside established companies with like hundred year old processes and some where like 
they're like, oh, God, we can't, um, you know, we got to go get 29 people's permission and management would never allow it, you know, and it's just impossible. And then I've worked with teams where they're like, oh, yeah, this to- makes total sense. Um, people who are afraid will say, well, I can't experiment with this. I have existing customers. But the smart people will say, um, this is an easy experiment to run because I have existing customers. And so, like, let's go take 1% of our customer base and see if we can improve the lifetime value by 1%. And in an established business, that can pay massive dividends, you know, in a matter of weeks or months rather than in a startup. Sometimes you don't know for years. So to me, if I look at those examples and say, what do the successful ones have in common and what do the unsuccessful ones have in common? It's really about team leadership, where the leader has been bold and, you know, really has a high-functioning team with a culture of, um, you know, a learning culture. It's been relatively easy. I mean, nothing's easy, but relatively easy. And where those conditions are not present, you know, greenfield, brownfield, like, boy, you're, it's, you're missing the boat. You've got a leadership problem. Yeah, you uh, know, one of the not things, a, go ahead. Sorry, one of the things that I'm always most impressed by is when you go into a company that doesn't even have source control, right? And they're into the tens plus million. But there's so much discipline of execution in this company, and they kind of almost... You know, they don't give themselves enough credit for just being, I, I often, we often say to folks, like, I can't believe you ship anything at all. Like, you have no source control, but you have very, you know, a high degree of discipline in executing. So just because you don't know the consulting speak or the new monikers, totally. all that stuff, like, you guys can execute, you know? And so let's just take all the, the veneer of the words off and, and focus on that execution. And the corollary to that is always the person that says, how do you guys hire your people? You know, like, like how, we need to have this certain hips, you know, young, you know, and you're like, well, hold on a second. Like you have folks that, you know, know your business, right? Or senior engineering, like they just, you know, th- these folks can accomplish anything. It's just a different code base or it's a different, you know, something or other, but what, you know, it, it's just amazing how those, you know, you know, what I mean? those kind of notions of what these totally. teams should look like. Yeah. My team's not hip enough. So therefore they're not innovative. And I, I hear that. I, I, and, and there's a trend, um, not just to focus on hiring more hip people, but also to put up more hip posters to encourage people to be more innovative. It's like, I, I, it, it was recently I saw some like list of, you know, the top X techniques for becoming more innovative. And, I, and like tip number one or two was like put up better posters. They put it a different way. But like, and, and to me, so I, I have this diagram in, in the book, Lean Startup. Um, I call it the startup way, which is just my way of remembering how to do these interventions. And it goes like this. It's a pyramid diagram, very simple. Accountability, process, culture, people, in that order. And everyone's going top down. How do I get hipper people? How do I put up, you know, how do I improve my culture by telling people like famous slogans or whatever, you know, like whatever like very trivial cultural intervention people want to make. Occasionally people will talk about process. Uh, rarely do people want to talk about accountability, but I think that that's exactly backward. You've got to first go in and say, what are people in this company aspiring to do? And if it's make the quarter, make my boss happy, take no risk, you know, be seen as a success, get promoted, then th- those are the impediments to innovation right there. But just before we even talk about agile process or anything, we've got to work on that stuff. Uh, and then we can work our way up that chain. And, and if you put teams together and give them the right accountability context and teach them these new processes, they will self-generate an amazing culture, which then you can try to export to the rest of the company. But you've got to incubate it inside your, you can't just go out and buy a hip, bunch of hip startup people. You know what happened. I mean, you guys, you've seen it, right? Like, sure, you go buy the hot, very uh, hip company, integrate it into your big company, and next thing you know, all those people have either converted to the boring way or they've quit. It, it never right. works the other way around. Right, when the mandate comes down that Ruby and Rails isn't a supported technology and yeah, right. register you know. company that does that. Um, yeah. you, you know, and, and to me, it's kind of like when I think back to 2001 and the rise of kind of the, the resume engines, you know, and people trying to find web, you know, people, and how drastically different it is these days since with people who can work from home, right, you have distributed global teams, the, the ability for an, an engineer who's good or a product person, anyone to be able to be part of a multinational or a product company from anywhere, from any time zone and be effective. And what we tell folks is, you know, being a relevant company, a place that, and most big companies have this platform for internal innovation and entrepreneurial things and be able to fund, you know, and we say to them, like, host some meetups here. Embrace the fact that you're trying to get better at product management. 
you know, and that by, by showing that you're a company that may host a meetup in your town, doesn't matter where your town is, or, you know, being involved in things, that, um, that you know, we see these non-traditionally educated people that have a variety of interesting backgrounds that make for great holistic product thinkers and the kind of folks that can, you know, internally advocate and make these things happen. And it's amazing how, you know, we keep hearing, well, we, we've told our recruiter, you know, find people with lean on the, on the resume. And it's, you know, I, I think in one of the previous webcasts you were mentioning, you know, to avoid the kind of orthodoxy of, hey, I know lean startup, you know. I'm I know, I know. Expert. It's hard. Well, listen, the best, the absolute best lean practitioners, the people that I really admire as entrepreneurs and look up to, first of all, they don't have a resume. Second of all, if they did have a resume, they wouldn't put lean startup on it. Because third of all, they don't consider themselves lean startup practitioners. They consider lean startup obvious and not even worth talking about. So it's like that example I gave you the other day. Like to me, the, the number one signifier of someone who is an internalized mastery of a subject material is that they think it's no big deal. It's an automatic reflex. They just do it. And those are the, I mean, I wish, that's why we do field trips and site visits and stuff at the conference. We, you, gotta see, you just got to see it in action. So like I took a, I had a very large company in San Francisco for a workshop. They brought a bunch of people to, to San Francisco and we were doing a workshop, private workshop for them. And I just asked them at the last minute, you know, would you guys like to take a field trip and meet some startups while you're here? And they said, sure. And they kind of not been interested, not been interested. But once we got them in Soma, they were in San Francisco, they started to get excited about it. I said, okay. So I just called a friend who has a, had at that time a five person startup. It happened to be physically nearby. I said, do you mind if we just come, come over? So we walk you know, from this fancy office to a dingy, you know, like back off, you know, like we go up this nasty staircase in a gold decrepit building and we, we show up and here's an office, you know, with five, you know, five kids in a room, big stacks of Costco stuff just thrown everywhere, like crappy Ikea tables and, you know, $10,000 Apple monitors on them, right? Like very, very interesting combination. And, and the big company were just asking them all these questions, like, how do you give updates to your investors? What do they hold you accountable for? You know, how do you decide on what to build? And it was, it was really cool because the kids had really good answers to those questions, but they had never thought about it before. No one had ever asked them before. So, like, I'm an investor in that company. That's why they were willing to accommodate us. And I, you know, I was like, when was the last time you guys gave me an update? And they were like, I don't know. We don't have any, we don't have any news yet. I don't have anything to tell you. But I'm not worried about it because on the other, like, a lot of companies use entitlement funding where... Once you start a project, it keeps getting automatically funded year after year, and you fight over funding. In a startup, we don't have that problem. I gave these kids some money, but I know for sure if they run out of money, I'm going to hear from them. Right. And if I never hear from them again, it probably means they ran out of money and they're dead. And that's okay. You know, like my my you talk about option analysis. Like my my downside cost was strictly limited, and they are very motivated to demonstrate that they learned something and report it back to me. Now, as a matter of fact, they they just raised a huge round and they're doing great, but. You know, at the time, we didn't know how it was going to turn out. And, and then they asked them, okay, how do you make your product management decisions? And this is a mobile app. So they said, well, mostly every week on Friday, we all meet at the end of the day and load the new build of the app onto our phone. We take it home over the weekend, use it every day, come back in on Monday and share our reflections and make our new plan. So it was like, and they were uh, launched in uh, an obscure app store, not the U.S. app store, but like some very small country like New Zealand. So like they also looked at some data too. But I mean, fundamentally, like it was a weekly cadence, run an experiment, try it out, see what the data says, immediately do the next thing. And these big company folks were like, their minds you know, were expanded in that moment. Because these, this startup never went through any kind of training. They're not lean startup you know, experts. They're not gurus or ninjas or whatever. They're just people getting shit done. And they just think this is the obvious way. Yeah, and you know, um, I want to make some time to make sure I pull a question or two from the, the feed. So, so here's one. Um, how do you deal with resistance to change, even from people that have hired you to make the company lean or agile in the first place? Well, uh, that's the worst. I mean, yeah. the people who hire you are the worst. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, no, no offense to the people who hire me. I'm, of course, I'm very grateful, uh, and, and you can you'll understand this. I'm actually not a very good consultant because, in, inevitably, if someone at the level of expense people have to go through and, and hassle to hire me, uh, senior management has had to sign off on the plan. So I have to meet with senior management and tell them what we're going to do, 
And so I meet with senior management and I say, hi, senior management, I hear that you feel like your people are not as innovative as you would like. Uh huh. And you really think that there's new opportunities for the business to, you know, make more money and have, all these, and have new growth. Fundamentally, people care about growth, not innovation. So growth, growth, growth. Uh, if we do these changes, they say, okay. And I say, great. Now look in the mirror. Now you're looking at the problem. Okay, now let's talk about how your behavior as senior management is directly creating the conditions inside the company that you want to change. And most of the time, that's the last meeting I ever have with senior management. It's like, thanks for coming in, kid. Like, you know, that's fascinating, but we wanted you to tell us what slogans to put up on the wall. Uh, so that's the first thing. Is just at, because I'm a consultant, I can take it or leave it. Like, I can be very, I can be matter of fact with people and say, look, I, I based on my experience and what I've written and the theory of LinkedIn, this is what I believe is required for change. If you're willing to do those things, then we're in business. And if not, hey, I know it's no sweat off my back because as a consumer. I want every product category I interact with to be created by a company that adopts these principles, a learning organization that's customer-centric, that is much faster with its iteration, all that good stuff. That's going to happen. And I don't care if it's a big company that survives and makes the change or they get disrupted by a startup. But the status quo is not viable. So it's, you know, it's not going to be things the way they've been in the last 10, 20, 100. Like, it's going to be different. You know, do you want to be the, the leader who drove that change or not? And, you know, people then say to me, well, that's great for you because you're a consultant, but I, you know, I work here. I don't have that kind of power. And I have to tell people, yes, you do. Right. Your no, time and energy is precious. Invest it where it makes a difference. And if not, don't. But easy for me to say, I know. No, I, uh, it's very true. You know, I'm always kind of floored when I see a big company that has spent a couple hundred thousand dollars doing an innovation, you know, whiteboard exercise where they get down to the five ideas they do kind of going in. And yeah. you ask, well, how long do these things stay on the whiteboard? It's like, well, it's hard for us to hire. And then it's like we do the innovation thing, and then we got to go back to our other processes for getting things done, and that means it slows, slows, slows way down. Yeah. As, as opposed to, um, you know, looking at, geez, if we took our budget for some of these things and instead of doing the big process to all sign off on the list of these are our big, you know, innovation ideas for 2014, we say, wow, how many of those, what could we do in 90 days for three or four of those to yeah. validate um, some of these I ideas? It's, it's hard to sometimes. It's, it's hard. Well, and the big, the big challenge is people have no idea what's possible. So, you know, for most of these senior managers, every project is a multi-year, multi-hundred million dollar, you know, behemoth that they're probably not even in their same job by the time it completes. So to go to them and say, listen, for $100,000 and 90 days, we can build an MVP that will prove the viability of one of these ideas. A lot of times they're just like, I can't even imagine that that's possible. Right. And, you know, so part of it is just saying it is like, it is possible. You can accomplish a tremendous amount in 90 days. You can... A team of five, a dedicated team of five with a dedicated budget and a short time window can do amazing things. You know, are you willing to run the experiment? You know, it's like it's a green eggs and ham thing. It's like try it, you'll like it. But are you willing to give that a try? And big companies, there's always plenty of budget. The great thing about innovation is that it's cheap at the beginning. So like this is not like affordability is not the problem. People are like, oh, we're resource constrained. I mean, are still able to spend a hundred million dollars on projects that don't work. So I'm like, if you can afford that, you can also afford $100,000 on running an experiment. One of my, that's true. So I don't know if we're out of time um, or, if, or it seems like we are, I think, hit 245. But I'll, I'll, unless Sarah tells me otherwise, I'll, I'll throw out the last question. Um, how do you build a B2B MVP if the first hardware prototype will cost a million before you've pivoted at all? Oh, I love that question because I've, I've done that. I've been there. Um, this used to be, I used to be able to have to give people really theoretical answers to this kind of question, but now I can give you the, the literal answer. Uh, good. And, and the first thing to understand is minimum viable product means minimal or faster uh, uh, compared to your competitors. So, so the first thing is a year and a million dollars might actually be incredibly fast. I was once working with a company where the typical new product development cycle in that business happened to be 10 years. So fundamentally, they come out with like minor tweaks here and there, but the fundamental platform for this is a physical product. They really would only rev it once every 10 years. And 
it was like a fast cycle time competitor in the market who could rev it every three or four years. So now, if you can rev it every three or four years, you will kick the butt of someone who revs every 10 years. But we went in there and said, what would it take to rev it every year? So, so getting down to one year and a million dollars to get to the first pivot, like that actually would have been a huge win. So that, nothing, nothing bad at all. Um, but, you know, I was, here's another situation. I was talking to a company where um, they had a product in mind that was going to take five years and, you know, I don't know, $75 million to build. Physical product, you know, long time before we would learn anything. And by analyzing the business plan, according to what are the, really the leap of faith assumptions here that we need to learn about, we were able to come up with things that we could do in 90 days to get quick learning. And they, they fell into two categories. The first is um, the reason something takes, when you say something takes a, a year and a million dollars, someone, whoever asks the question, they have in mind a certain specification because the specification drives the difficulty. So the first question we always ask is, what could we do to the specification to decrease the level of difficulty for the engineers? Like, what if the performance target bring the date of first delivery in? And in some cases, we can bring it so far in, the engineering team will say, wait a minute, instead of building a whole new product, why don't we just modify an existing product to hit that new, much lower specification? Now, of course, people will say, but wait a minute, wait a minute. The experiment is supposed to be, what about the high specification important thing? But uh, a lot of leap of faith assumptions can be tested with a much well, Customers will say, well, I didn't need all that extra performance. This is fine. Totally adequate. And now you just made, you just saved yourself years of your life because you found out the cut the customer really wants. The second approach is, okay, but, but maybe the questioner would say, yeah, but that, no, I can't do that. My, in my situation, it's impossible. And I would say, okay, well, in that case, what could we do in parallel with the product development in parallel so that you have orders for it when the product development cycle completes? And I know we're running out of time, so I won't get into all the details of what that looks like, but I, I've been through that a couple times, and it, it's amazing what happens when you go to a customer and you say, we are working on this product right now. Would you like to be the first to pre-order it? Here, this, here's the spec sheet we're working to, and watch the customer throw up all over it. Really cool things can happen. Yeah, and I would just only add to that that there's a great book out of the MIT Media Lab called Fab, uh, which talks about the application mm. of open source kind of principles to manufacturing and development, taking it into the field, and and you know, overly optimizing for efficient manufacturing as opposed to focusing on what people want. Right? It, it's amazing what can can come out of out of talking to customers. Well, Eric, this has been awesome. Uh, it's, it's really great to to share the, the virtual big screen w with you and to get your insights on all of these things. No, My um, pleasure. Thanks for doing it. I'm sure for most of the folks out there, you know, you can often feel like you're the, the only person waving the flag. And so it's always good to get some top cover and some URLs to point back to. You got uh, it. I'll turn it over to you. But thanks again, and thanks for everyone for, for joining.